Hi, welcome to Ions Health Talk with Dr. Akram. I am Akram. In this program, we'll be talking about all kinds of different health issues with different experts in the field. Today, we'll be talking about heartburn and upper gastrointestinal cancer. So sit back, relax, enjoy your time with us. Heartburn and acid reflux. This is a common condition we see day to day in our life. Gastrointestinal re reflux disease, also known as acid reflux, is a long-term condition in which stomach contents rise up to the esophagus, resulting in either symptoms of symptoms or complications. Mm -hmm. Symptoms include the taste of acid in the back of the mouth, heartburn, bad breath, chest pain, regurgitation, breathing problems, and wearing away the teeth. Complications include esophagitis, esophageal stricture, etc. Obesity, pregnancy, smoking, hiatus hernia, and taking certain medicines are the main risk factors. In the Western world, between 10 to 20 percent of the population is affected by gastroesophageal reflux disease. Occasional gastroesophageal reflux disease without troublesome symptoms or complications is even more common. The classic symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease were first described in 1925 when Friedenwald and Feldman commented on heartburn and its possible relationship to hiatus hernia. In 1934, gastroenterologist Asher Wilkinson described reflux and attributed the symptoms to stomach acid. Let's look at what is upper gastrointestinal cancer. There are seven main types of gastrointestinal cancers, such as esophageal, stomach, pancreatic, duodenal, gallbladder, and bile duct liver, and small bowel. Together, they account for approximately 11% of the cancers in the UK. Esophageal cancer, this can develop anywhere along the length of the esophagus. Two common types are adenocarcinoma of the esophagus and squamous cell carcinoma. Stomach cancer, most stomach cancers develop in cells lining the stomach. This type of cancer is called an adenocarcinoma of the stomach. This is usually developed very slowly. Okay, to learn and understand these conditions clearly, let's welcome our special guests on the show. They both are joining from Salford via Skype. Let's welcome Dr. Nadir Ibrahim, who is a consultant anesthetist and an honorary university lecturer. And also, let's welcome Mr. Osama El Hardello, who is a general and upper gastrointestinal consultant surgeon. They both work in Salford Royal NHS Foundation. Hello, Hello Dr. Nadir there. Ibrahim. And Hello, Akram. Hello, Mr. Hello. Osama. Good evening. Uh, yeah. Hello, Hello everyone. Hello. Nice to meet you all. Welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you feeling today? Uh, well, um, a bit more, a bit excited to confront a, a big uh, kind of viewers. Excellent. We have a lot of viewers, and they are really anxiously waiting for what what you guys are going to say and what I'm going to ask you. Anyway, first of all, let's break the ice. Nadir, let's talk. What are you like? What do you do generally? What what kind of uh, doctor are you? Yes, I'm. A, I'm actually I'm a, a consultant in anesthesia and uh, intensive care, and I work with Salford Royal Hospital. Originally from Sudan, and um, I was born in Saudi, and uh, I trained in the UK, and um, I became a consultant anesthetist, as I said, in intensive at Salford Royal Hospital, and I've been working with my colleague, uh, Mr. Osama Hadar, for a few years now, and we uh, we deal with lots of other problems, which is in, in in particular the topic of this tonight's show, and I'm very glad to be involved in this uh, very interesting topic. Osama, please let, let's hear about you as well. What would you like to All say? All right. All right. First, let me say uh, thank you for allowing me the chance to join your program, Akram, and uh, welcome to all the viewers. Uh, very pleased to meet you all. Uh, my name is uh, Osama Il Hadello. I'm an uh, upper GI and um, consultant and general surgeon in Salford Royal Hospital. 
I specialize in these type of problems, the surgical aspect of them, um, and uh, I would love to talk to you all about it. Excellent. This is excellent. Okay, this is a live program, so call us on 0203-515-5788. If you have questions or suggestions, or write to us, healthtalk at intv.co.uk. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook, Iron Health Talk with Dr. Akram. And of course, you can watch us on Facebook Live, intv.co.uk. Okay, um, today we're going, to, we're going to start with a caller who is joining straight away on our line. Um, okay, let's get him into the show, and uh, but we're going to continue the program very quickly because we have a big schedule ahead and we want to cover as much as possible. Okay, hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Hello, hi, sorry, madam. Okay, what's your name, please? Yeah, sorry, sir. Yeah, um, my name is Miss Bacon. Okay, hello. Yeah, welcome to the show. Um, okay. Yeah, I, have a, I have a quick question to the doctor. Uh, basically, my mom, she's diabetic and she takes insulin as well. And she's been having really bad pain on her teeth, on one of her teeth, and she's not, she's not able to get any appointment from the dentist or anything because of COVID. Okay. So I was just wondering if you could give any stuff. Okay. Any help and what she can do for now? Excellent. Thank you very much for your call. But at the moment, we are going to talk a different subject. And these uh, two of my specialists, are they are dealing with uh, uh, different kind of problems. What you could do, you could call me after 8.30. I will answer your call and I will deal with it. Or you could uh, send me a message on my Facebook li link. Or you could send me an email and we will, we will sort you out, yeah? Okay, let's go ahead with the program, guys. Um, okay, let's talk. What is this, uh, what is, uh, Osama, what is this heartburn, what is this reflux things about? Okay, so uh, reflux or heartburn is a very vague symptom. Uh, it's very difficult to give a precise definition of it. Uh, but fortunately, a, a large amount, a large sector of the population suffers this thing on a daily basis. Uh, any sort of discomfort or a burning sensation in the middle of the chest um, that is somehow related to food uh, is nominated as reflux. People sometimes do call it, do call it indigestion. Uh, some people will call it heartburn. Some people will say acidity. Uh, all of that are terms related to uh, reflux. Excellent. Nadir, how common is these things? Um, you would see in your anesthetic practices, um, do you see very frequently these things we we see quite frequently actually um out of uh, talking about maybe out it's one in every two to three thousand of operations we have um you might have half of this number who might uh, suffer from reflux and half of that number might actually develop into complications uh, and the reflux that means the content of the stomach the stomach contents can actually uh, migrate all the way up and cause what's called aspiration. That means either the acid or the stomach contents can go to the lung. And by that means the simple, that makes a simple operation, which is might last for about half an hour to an hour. It might end up the patient being in ICU for weeks and in some very severe conditions, it might cause actually, um, uh, unfortunately death by severe infection to the lung. Okay. So as an anesthetist, so as one of the part, one of the most important uh, aspects in when you do our history and seeing patients in preparation to surgery, we ask um, whether the patients suffer from refluxes or heartburns, and we have to document that very clearly and discuss the risks uh, associated with that with the patient before getting their consent for surgery. Okay, okay, it's it's what we're talking about. It's um, if they're going for a surgery and there is a possibility of aspiration if they have this reflux disease. Yeah, okay, that's what Indeed. we talk. But let's look at this video. This uh, this will explain a lot, and um, then uh, we can talk a bit. Um, this is all about how this 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 reflux happens and this animation uh, thanks to um, the websites they have done it and we're going to watch this and let's continue the program afterwards esophageal cancer is a disease that begins in your esophagus
Your esophagus is a muscular tube that food passes through from your mouth to your stomach. The flat, thin cells lining your esophagus are called squamous cells. Below the surface, cells divide and flatten to make new squamous cells as the old ones wear out. If you have a condition called gastroesophageal reflux, or GERD, you frequently have a backflow or reflux of acid from your stomach into your esophagus. Over time, GERD may cause the squamous cells lining your lower esophagus to be replaced with gland cells that make mucus called goblet cells. This change in the lining of your esophagus is a condition called Barrett's esophagus. One type of esophageal cancer, called adenocarcinoma, may occur in the changed lining of Barrett's esophagus. Another type of esophageal cancer, called squamous cell carcinoma, occurs in the squamous cells in your esophagus. Like all cancers, both of these types begin when damaged or abnormal genetic material inside your cells causes them to grow out of control. A tumor forms as the abnormal cells begin to multiply. Over time, a lump may form in the wall of your esophagus as the tumor grows. You may have no symptoms in the early stages of esophageal cancer. Later, you may have trouble swallowing when the tumor becomes large enough to block part of your esophagus. Having trouble with swallowing may cause you to have difficulty eating. As a result, you may lose weight in a short period of time. Depending on the location of the growing tumor, you may also have pain in your chest or neck. If you have esophageal cancer, your doctor may recommend one or more of the following. Surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. Surgery is the most common treatment for esophageal cancer, especially in the early stages when the tumor is small. If you have a surgical procedure, your doctor will remove the section of your esophagus that contains the tumor, as well as some normal tissue above and below it. The surgery may include removing part of your stomach. The remaining healthy esophagus and stomach will be attached to each other. Your surgeon may also remove nearby lymph nodes to see if cancer cells have spread to them. Your doctor may recommend chemotherapy as a main treatment for more advanced tumors or to shrink your tumor before surgery. Chemotherapy uses drugs to stop cancer from spreading by either stopping or slowing down the growth of cancer cells. Your doctor may recommend radiation therapy, such as external beam radiation therapy, in addition to chemotherapy. Radiation therapy damages and kills the esophageal cancer cells. Some common ways to reduce your risk of esophageal cancer include seeking treatment if you have gastroesophageal reflux or GERD, quitting smoking, and avoiding alcohol. Uh, welcome back anyway. Uh, thank you very much for the Nucleus Health for the wonderful video they provided us and we have taken it from the YouTube and it was an amazing video. But anyway, it, it would have explained to you mostly what is uh, it about and what the talk is going to be about. Um, Anyway, um, let's talk a bit, Osama, let's summarize quickly about the symptoms and, and signs and symptoms of this uh, gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn, whatever we call it. 
are variable and are quite common to affect people, uh, especially following um, eating big meals or greasy food um, or uh, having to have a big meal and then go to bed. Um, um, the symptoms, um, they, what you, well, they, the question which might struck the minds of many people is what to do when you have got these symptoms. Um, uh, the, you, you need to have some uh, red flags that will um, raise in front of your face. If you develop any of them, then you have got to seek medical, medical advice straight away. If you have got uh, reflux symptoms of more than uh, twice a time during the week, or you start uh, developing intense chest pain, or difficulty in swallowing, or painful swallowing, or starting to lose weight, or vomiting vigorously and continuously, in that case, these are called red flag symptoms that needs you to report them to your GP. And it's very likely that the GP will lead on from there and ask for uh, a common investigation, which is having uh, a camera look at the top part of, uh, of, your, of, your, of your gut. And, and that is called endoscopy. <coughs> okay. this, is, this is the normal pathway of most of the people when, de when they develop these symptoms. They will go ahead to, to their GP, and the GP is very likely to ask for that test to happen. Okay, perfect. Also, um, uh, thank you very much, um, Osama. And um, Nadir, uh, let's, t let's talk a little bit about uh, this uh, pregnancy and um, overweight. How does it affect this uh, reflux? Yeah, uh, the, the majority of that actually is actually a combination between two hormonal and uh, and mechanical, but uh, makes it easier for people to understand that in both conditions there is a lot of hormonal changes uh, from the obesity point of view and from the pregnancy point of view. There is a lot of relaxation in the um, in the muscles uh, between the stomach and the oesophagus, and that makes things worse. Uh, but uh, mainly, which is music, make it easier for people to understand that is the mechanical uh, plays a big part in causing the reflux. Um, from the pregnancy point of view, the first and second trimester, maybe they're, they're not really a big problem. But when it comes to the third trimester, uh, the size of the baby and basically pressing through the uterus, through the stomach, increasing these, the, the, the pressure uh, over the stomach area and that basically delaying the emptying of the stomach. So the delay of whatever the meal the mother will have. And that means the content of the stomach will be more there for longer. Number two, uh, the mechanical actually compression of the stomach actually increase the risk of things basically going upwards rather than going downwards. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Osama. Let's do. Let's talk about what are the do's for um, what we should do for this um, this heartburn or reflux condition. Okay. The the first do I have to say is that most of, of the people. Um, um, they should have to um, um, not to be so worried about it. Um, and if the symptoms persist, you have got to somehow modify your lifestyle, starting by um, eating small frequent portions rather than big two meals or three meals. Um, 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 reduction of weight is very important in that sense. Uh, not to try not to adopt any posture which brings the stomach contents to the top, to the gullet, uh, and try to space the time that you go to bed from the last meal that you've had um, by about three to four hours. Uh, most of, the, of those measures will be quite successful in people, and there are two harmful effects from both smoking and consuming alcohol. Smoking and alcohol, that's the important thing. And yes. alcohol. Bo both of them are toxic to the lining of the gullet and the stomach, and they can aggravate the problem. Excellent. Nadir, let's go quickly through what are the don'ts, what we should not do. Well, pretty much, pretty much the op <laughs> in simple terms, like the opposite of what, what my colleagues have just <laughs> mentioned. Uh, and basically, the don'ts, which is don't, basically don't smoke, um, uh, don't drink, uh, make sure you don't have a meal. Uh, and then after the meal, or heavy meal, uh, and then you go to bed straight away, uh, give a gap of between three to four hours at least before you go to bed. Or if you have a meal, make sure it's not, as Osama is, has mentioned, maybe just make sure it's a small portion, make sure that you, you walk a bit or you just don't go straight away to bed, uh, and stuff like that. So, um, and if you have any medication being prescribed to you to, to reduce or to relieve the signs of symptoms of heartburns, 
uh, don't just stop them because you're just fed up with it or you don't get bother anymore. I think it's very important to adhere to what that your GP or your surgeon or your uh, gastroenterologist has advised and prescribed some medication for you. It's very important to continue with these medications. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, Osama, where to get help first? So first the, line of yeah, help. The, the, fir the first point of call will be either a pharmacist or a GP. In the milder forms of, of symptoms, there are uh, so many medications that can be bought over the counter, things as gaviscone um, and uh, uh, ranitidine, sametidine, and uh, even omeprazole, lansoprazole, esomeprazole, they're all acid-reducing tablets. And if they have been effective, uh, that means there isn't anything sinister behind, uh, be, be behind the symptoms, and you, you don't need to get worried. If the symptoms persist, though, of those uh, measures that I've just talked about and the over-the-counter medications, you should see your GP, who will discuss the matter further in details with you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I think what we're going to do, we're going to talk more about the surgical measure, what you guys do in the hospital. Gastroesophageal reflux disease and upper gastroesophageal uh, cancer. So far, we talked about um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and uh, we have explained the symptoms, signs, and um, more about it, but we're going to talk more about the surgical bit later. And uh, on our show, the special guests are from, uh, both from Salford Royal um, NHS Trust and Dr. Nadir Ibrahim. He's an anesthetic consultant and um, honorary lecturer and uh, Osama El Hardallo, he's a uh, upper gastro um, surgeon and a general surgeon, he he, they both work in the same hospital. Okay, welcome back Nadir and uh, Osama. Okay, we're going to go uh, straight away, we're going to talk about what you guys do in theatre for these uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Oh, so uh uh, briefly and quickly, uh, for the gastroesophageal reflux is mostly uh, a non-surgical condition. So 90% of the people can be treated with the measures we have mentioned or with medications only. So the idea that uh, surgery uh, is essential isn't right uh, for in, in, in the minds of so many people. Uh, surgery is mainly to correct some structural changes. If we look back at the video, and assume the structure, one of the important risk factors for gastroesophageal reflux is hiatus hernia, where the stomach will pop up into the chest through the hole in between the tummy and the chest. And when the stomach goes into the chest, just next to the gullet, the gullet will be subjected to a large amount of acid. Correcting that into place by bringing the stomach back into the tummy cavity and reducing the size of that hole in between the chest and the tummy uh, will help uh, creating a bit of tension at the site of the junction in between the gullet and the stomach, and all of the stomach contents uh, will be as normal um, where they do belong to into the stomach rather than going up and causing the reflux. There are so many procedures um, in that the, the, the most famous one is what we call fundoplication, or in a lay term it's called the wrap, and that wrap makes the top of the stomach quite bulky so that it can't go back into the chest through that hole. But as I said, uh, only a minority of people will need that. Oh, excellent. Anyway, this is a live program, so you can still call us on 0203-515-5788 if you have any questions related to the subject. If anything uh, else you have, please write to me uh, on uh, our on our email or on our Facebook link. Anyway, let's talk about the upper gastrointestinal cancer. I have explained in the beginning in uh, in my talk, it's about 11% of the cancers in the UK. And we played a video as well in the beginning, uh, which explained more about how the cancer develops and etc. Osama, let's talk, um, what are the main symptoms? Can it be silent? Uh, it can be silent in the case that it is um, in the pancreas. This is the most famous silent killing cancer. Um, uh, and uh, thank God it's, 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 not, it's not very common. But th this is the most dangerous silent one. Uh, sometimes cancers of the stomach can be silent as well because the stomach has got a capacious cavity inside. And the cancer, when it happens, it doesn't cause a lot of problems as it 
uh, grows and, enlarge, and enlarges within that cavity. Uh, cancer of the gullet, um, most of the times, is early picked because it causes significant symptoms. And the most important symptom is inability to swallow, where the food gets uh, stuck in the way uh, down to the stomach. Because it's, it's a narrow tube, any size effect within that narrow tube will cause a blockage, and people will start uh, feeling that. And this is uh, um, um, a symptom which is of paramount to be reported to the GP because the earlier we discover the cancer, the easier it is to, to, to be cured. Okay. Nadir, is it, uh, is it uh, genetic related or is it food habits or what caused this kind of cancer? I think maybe, uh, I think uh, in both uh, in same situations, but uh, I think maybe Osama can maybe comment on this a bit more than me. And, uh... Absolutely. Yeah, environmental factors are much more implicated into apogee cancer than, than genetics. In very rare occasions, genes are involved. So the upper GI cancers are unlike the breast cancer and the cancer which are pretty much linked to genetics. Uh, most of the times they are environmental, and the factors, environmental factors implicated into this are mostly related to food. And uh, the common predisposing factor, which is the step forward to cancer before any cancer happens uh, in the gullet, is what we call Barrett's esophagus. It's, it's a common, it's a very common condition. It's a common condition, and at the same time, it's reported a lot um, in the terms of doctors. Barrett's is changing in the line of the lower part of the gullet into a lining which is different to the normal lining of the gullet, uh, a lining which is more or less similar to the stomach lining or to the bowel lining, and that's the first um, a transformation of normal tissue into cancerous tissue. And Barrett's. Uh, can't be on its own. It's a sequence of the subjection of the lower part of the gullet, the lining of the gullet, to, lo to long time, years and years of acid. So cancer started with acid irritation to the gullet, conversion of the gullet lining into another form of lining, and the last step is transformation of that abnormal lining into cancerous cells. Excellent. Let's Let's talk a little bit about when to seek help for each kind of cancer? Is there any clue it gives? That, that's a brilliant point, actually. Mm -hmm. So the, the symptoms of cancer uh, that you have got to look at, as we mentioned earlier, difficulty in swallowing, any form of difficulty in swallowing, significant amount of weight loss, um, uh, any vomiting that continued for a long time, and specifically vomiting of blood, that is very significant. If you feel a lump into your tummy, a hard lump into your tummy, that, that's an ominous sign. If you have got your, the, the color of the skin changed into yellow color, what we call it jaundice, so any discoloration in the skin, or if the urine becomes pretty much dark, or the stool, the poo becomes pretty much pale, in that, this is one of the symptoms of cancer, so people has got to report it as early as they could to the GP so that they can be investigated earlier. <laughs> Nadir, one of your friend apparently had um, a condition and um, that yes, he uh, has was, unfortunately that's passed exactly away. Was, uh, Would you like exactly to tell what, about us? Uh, Mr. Hadal Osama has mentioned, I think the key um, or the key message you take home out of this out of this consultation of this program, you seek medical advice as early as possible. Um, got friends and family who uh, ignored the symptoms and they thought that it's only just a passing. Uh, they changed the habit of eating and the, the meals, etc. And unfortunately, it was too late when they when they, they, they they went to surgery, and it was very advanced stage of the cancer, and unfortunately, they passed away. So if there is a message you take out of this consultation today, just to be aware of the symptoms and signs of heartburns, I think to differentiate between the heartburns, which is can cause, you know, to be worries, and as Osama has mentioned, you have to go to the GPS early as possible. And the most important bit from our end, as well as an anesthetist, just to make sure is actually differentiate between that and heartburns as being a, a reflux or a cancer or being a cardiac origin. Exactly, um, that's what I want to stress on it. Yeah. Can miss that. 
Indeed, and that's why the G, there where the GP comes in, uh, and people are really not convinced they can still go to uh, seek a medical advice. Um, simple tests like ECG and uh, blood tests can actually help to rule out or to differentiate between the two, two the symptom, the, between the two diseases, um, which is that it can be a life-saving uh, uh, visit to your GP. So the key message here, don't delay. As early as possible, you seek medical advice, and that will be, uh, can be you know, the, a big factor. So the message is like what the symptoms, uh, uh, as Osama described a few minutes ago, if you have those symptoms, get help as early as possible. Okay, let's talk. Uh, let's. These conditions are mostly not medically treated, isn't it, Osama? They get referred to you at some point. At what point do they get referred to you? Okay, uh, people do get referred um, to the higher tier of uh, treatment, to the hospitals. Uh, when they got any of the red flag symptoms we have just mentioned, or when they fail the uh, conservative measures and the medical therapy, if um, someone has got uh, to adopt all of these measures and take the tablets and, and they found that all it's, it's non-use, then when they come to the hospital, um, the first investigation to be done for them most of the times is to look at the top part of their body through the camera test. This is a very simple, straightforward test uh, which can be done most of the times when the patient is awake. And it has, it's, it's a, there is a little bit of discomfort, but it's, it's, it's not horrendous as uh, what people sometimes might describe about it, different experiences. But uh, it's very vital because it allows you to have a look at the lining of the gullet, lining of the stomach, lining of the first part of the bowel following the stomach um, with the naked eye and can make the, um, whether the surgeon or the gastroenterologist come up with a lot of diagnoses from that and exclusions. And we keep a very low threshold uh, to take as many specimens as we go in with the camera because that helps uh, when, when we look at it under the microscope, we'll be able to detect the cause of their symptoms. And um, once that camera test has happened, obviously, the um, um, uh, ominous thing is to try and exclude bad things. Um, if there is anything suspicious, specimens will be taken and the doctor will be uh, talking to the patient on the spot. Uh, because if there is anything bad, the key here is early detection. Cancer, if it's early detected, it's treatable, it's curable. But once it passes a certain stage, then all the aim of the, of the doctors will be to help out to stop uh, the progression of the disease, but there will be no view to cure uh, the person or the patient off. Excellent. The point is that early detection, so you seek help early. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay, Nadir, do you give uh, anesthesia for these, uh, these procedures, what we talked about? This is... Um the endoscope. Yes, indeed, we do. Um, obviously, uh, in particular, I work a lot with uh, with Osama in theater. Um, so it, it depends. If we're doing the the first type of surgery, which is for repair of hiatus hernia, uh, the majority of patients actually they're not very unwell. Um, so from from pre-optimization or prehab point of view, which is getting the patients ready for surgery. It doesn't require lots of work, uh, routine blood tests, etc. It depends obviously in the, in the other medical background the patient has. But when it comes to cancer patients, usually they are frail patients. Uh, the, the, the disease itself already has affected the, uh, the absorption and the, the nutrition in general. So they usually, in our center, the Sulfur Dryer, we one of the small centers in the, in the country, um, number of in the country who do something called the CPEX, which is cardiopulmonary exercise testing, uh, which is basically to make sure and prepare the patients through the journey uh, before preparing them for surgery. And the surgery itself is not a simple surgery; it takes hours and hours. Uh, it, it sometimes it's done in uh, two stages, sometimes done in three stages within the within the time of surgery. And the recovery, they have to go to intensive care after that for at least 48 hours or so. Um, it combines a lot of uh, other uh, special measures like uh, epidural for pain relief afterwards. And after spending a few nights in intensive care, then they go to back to the um, to the ward. And usually, I think maybe someone can comment on that. Maybe I think about 10 days or so. I haven't seen someone go home before seven to 10 days after Absolutely. staying in surgery. I agree. Yeah. Um, so we play as an anesthetist uh, actually a big role 
in the uh, prehab and, um, and preparing patients for big surgery as such, and in theater as well from the fluid management, etc., and and the lung ventilation because we have to deflate one of the lungs to to allow a good area for the surgeons like Sama to basically to have approach to the where the cancer is and manage to take the cancer out. And then after that, to make sure the fluid balance is all right, the pain control is a key, and that will allow them to breathe well after surgery. And the main and the, the main purpose for breathing well after surgery that means reduce the risk of having pneumonia or chest infection. So a lot of physio is involved, and as I said, maybe two to three days in intensive care before go to high dependency and then to the ward, and successfully afterwards home and actually get referred, and actually followed up by. Osama's team afterwards, yeah. after surgery, to make sure it's they're what, actually in full recovery. What you're trying to say, this is one of the major operations. It's unlike most operations we do, the anesthetist uh, finish off the job on the day. But here, you need to work as a team. It's the surgeon, anesthetist, the patient, and all of the healthcare workers around the patient working to cure or, or, or to support this patient. Is that right? It is a multidisciplinary approach uh, by all means. Uh, and as I said, uh, nutrition is involved as well. Uh, some exercises, we advise patients to start changing their way of life, uh, do a bit of lots of exercising before surgery, walking maybe for a mile or two every day to build that stamina, that stamina, actually right. fitness level to make sure. So it's a journey, it's not only me and Osama do it, it's actually the patient has to be involved, they have to buy into it, they have to be yeah. motivated, you know that actually it's a big excellent. surgery excellent. and we're all looking forward to as a successful journey. That's excellent. Osama, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, these cancers uh, time permits. Let's talk a little bit what you do for the esophageal cancer. Um, in small formats of people can understand a bit. Of course, yeah. So uh, with esophageal cancer, with, with all of the esophageal cancers, the treatment basically goes into one of two limbs, either a curative way or a palliative way. The curative way is when the cancer reaches a certain stage uh, where we can really get rid of every cancer cell that we can see in the patient. And that way of treatment is very much aggressive and it needs a lot of uh, efforts from the different parts of the team, um, lots of um, um, physiology and uh, regeneration capacity from the uh, body of the patient himself. The other limb is a palliative way where we can't get rid um, of the cancer completely, but we will try to stop the progression of the disease and try to mitigate the symptoms somehow. So um, um, the patients will fall into one of one of uh, either of these categories, and unfortunately, um, upper GI cancers in general have got a notoriously bad um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, yeah. It, they've, they've got a, a very bad effect. Uh, Fifty uh, fifty percent of the people will go to the cure limb, and fifty percent of the people will go to the palliative limb, uh, and and it's all as I said around early detection. The, the earliest the cancer is detected, the high likely that this cancer uh, can be cured. Can be cured, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. The ways, the ways of this curative treatment is multimodality as well. Surgery is one thing for certain types of cancer, but the surgery itself is quite an aggressive one where large, big chunks of the, of the um, uh, top part of the gut are removed and then you've got a big operation to do the plumbing and join the rest of the ends together. And um, the, other, the other modalities are either chemotherapy or radiotherapy or a combination of both. And sometimes there are newly uh, formed treatments in the form of hormonal therapy and immunotherapy as well. Uh, now with the pancreatic cancer, the liver cancer, and the uh, stomach cancer, the operations are, are massive as well, and, and these modalities would chip in at the same time. Um, uh, now, uh, with, with the palliative way of treatment, a surgery is most of the time excluded. And uh, what happens is that we um, most of the times give these people either radiotherapy or chemotherapy uh, to reduce the burden of the disease and mitigate their symptoms by uh, placing stents uh, which would relieve any obstruction that happens in the gut because of the cancer um, and try to uh, prescribe a certain amount of medications. 
Um, the reassuring point is that the um, um, uh, treatment of, of each patient of suspected or proved cancer is taken within the hands of a team which is multidisciplinary. So every specialty that could help in treatment of cancer patients is involved in that team. In that and team. the decision, the decision 100% of the times is being taken by a group of people. It's not only the surgeon, nor the anesthetist, nor the chemo doctor, the oncologist, nor the radiologist, the x-ray doctor, uh, nor the histopathologist, the people who look under the microscope. It's, it's like an opinion from a complete team. Okay, there's a, uh, there's a question coming through the Facebook and what they ask is, uh, is that we're doing an operation on the esophagus or stomach and what happened to that part of the stomach? Do, do What happened to the capacity of uh, the stomach? Can they eat normal meals and how they manage it afterwards? Yeah, in simple terms, we chop it off. So the cancer itself, the site of the cancer, and a good distance, when I say a good distance, I'm, sp I'm talking about five to 10 centimeters, will be removed um, from the nearby tissues of the stomach itself, and um, uh, a large chunk of, of the tissues around them to try and um, make sure that every cancer cell is being taken away from the patient. The whole of that is, is gonna be taken out of the body. Following that, definitely in most, in, and I would say 100% of the surgeries, the, the, the stomach will get uh, very small in size. You will, you will end up having two-fifths of the normal size of the stomach. And uh, as a sequel of that, the golden advice for people following these types of surgeries is that they will never uh, go back to take those big meals. They have to um, 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 manage their ambitions and um, assume the life after cancer surgery as a life of a certain lifestyle. They have to take frequent small portions of meals. They have got to be nutritionally well supported um, by a lot of, of things as well, uh, supportive measures and medications and stuff. And the follow-up for this uh, type of people uh, will carry on for at least five years. Five years. That's right. Yeah. Nadir, what, what do we do straight away in the post-op uh, period? The patients are there. Uh, with the team for first few days, isn't it? Yes. What do you, um, what do you say? Said, on um, they go to intensive care, which is covered by, by our colleagues and uh, who do intensive care as well. So that we, that, I think the key for this, the early mobilization of patients. Uh, the, the days has gone past a long time ago where people are coming for a surgery and they expect to stay in the hospital for three to four weeks. So we wake up the patient immediately. In the past, people used to be asleep after surgery and we wake them up next day or so. But nowadays, no, thanks to to what we do at Salford Royal Hospital and, and other big centers. We do that prehab very well. So the patient actually came prepared psychologically and physiologically to big operation as such. Secondly, That's a good point, isn't it? Psychologically, this is a major impact for patients, isn't it? taking a big part of the guts out. It is indeed. And as I said, the, the psychologically is very important to be prepared that this is going to happen to them. Second, uh, to make sure that they are aware that this has happened, that will happen, that will affect them waking up. Uh, you have to wake them up straight away after surgery. You have to tell them that there will be a, something which is called a nasogastric tube. There will be a tube in their nose going all the way to their stomach to start feeding them slowly. Uh, and they will wake up in ICU uh, in th after theater, but after that we'll take them to ICU awake. And thanks to the epidural and the modes, as I said, I stressed earlier, the epidural, one of the key modes of analgesia, Make sure that if it works very well, then they can be mobilized out of bed straight away. That's very good. Physiotherapy can come to that. Excellent. Thank you very much. We're running out of time, and uh, we had a great time talking about this. I think um, we have passed, uh, we have covered through the subject, and we have given the main points to the patients. If they, if the basic point was, if you have any of those symptoms, what we said, seek help straight away. Is that right? Absolutely. Do you want to say any bullet point, anything uh, special before we uh, sum up this show? Osama, go ahead. Osama. Uh, yeah, well, my, my, my main message to the people uh, is that don't ignore, the, don't ignore the red flag symptoms that we've just uh, passed and gone through, uh, especially when you're over 40. Uh, take the matter quite seriously. Uh, don't be deceived by the symptoms uh, disappearing at some point and coming again. Um, go and consult your GP, 
try to uh, comply with the investigations that, that are planned for you. And okay. uh, I, I think most of the people will get away with these symptoms quite, quite okay. easily. Thank you very much. Nadir, quickly, I have a few seconds, oh, less than a few seconds for you. <laughs> okay. I just want to tell them that, um, as Osama said, I echo what he exactly said. It's a multidisciplinary journey. Uh, make sure it's not like the old days. It's, a, it's, it's actually a curable operation. It's a big operation, but with the thanks to the pre-operative department and the, uh, the prehab system and center and the, our colleagues in intensive care, it's a curable, it's a livable, and you can go through it easily. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadir Ibrahim and uh, Mr. Osama El Hardello. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution today and uh, for being in our show. And uh, thank you for all watching us and being with us on the show. Uh, and if you have any more questions, please write to us on our email or on our uh, Facebook link. Well, we will see you in a similar program next time. And until then, look after yourselves. Thank you. Bye-bye.